After Tuesday's win in Alberta, Jason Kenney joins the ranks of a growing number of Conservative Premiers. Premiers that were not part of the landscape in November 2015. Back then, a newly elected Liberal government found allies in other Liberal provinces. But fast forward to 2019 and things look a lot bluer. And some of those new faces share similar messages from Doug Ford. And tonight, we have sent a clear message to the world Ontario is open for business. To now Jason Kenney. Today, our great province has sent a message to Canada and the world. Alberta is open for business. They are joining forces and standing up to Ottawa. So what does this new landscape mean for Justin Trudeau? How about Andrew Scheer? And what's next for Jason Kenney? It's Thursday, and that means at issue is here. Chantal Hébert is in Montreal. Andrew Coyne is in Toronto. And Chachi Curl joins us from Victoria tonight. Good to see everyone. So let, let's start with Tuesday's results in Alberta and what we think it means for the rest of the country. Uh, Chantal, why don't you start off? Hmm. Well, uh, I, if the rest of the country did not expect uh, Jason Kenney to win, uh, then no one was paying attention for the past year and a half. Uh, I am uh, wary to say that as Alberta goes, the country does not necessarily go, but that has been a fact of life. And uh, not to throw any rain on, on tonight's parade, Four years ago, almost to the day, we sat around similar tables and Rachel Notley had just scored a historic win and an election was coming federally and that was supposed to mean great things for the NDP and Thomas Mulcair because if Alberta would trust the NDP mm -hmm. with its government, why would not other Canadians? And the rest is history. Mm -hmm. So Andrew Shear shouldn't be throwing a party yet, Andrew, is that how we should take that? <laughs> well, we, uh, Chantel makes a very effective point that no one knows for sure. Uh, I suspect it's going to take a while to see exactly what this means. I suspect we may see a bit of a phony war over the next few months until the federal election is through with, because I'm not sure it suits either the Liberals or the uh, Alberta Conservatives to really ignite hostilities. I think mm -hmm. partly because Al the Alberta Conservatives, Jason Kenney is a former federal cabinet minister, He's very plugged into the national party. He's very connected to the other provincial parties. So this is not Alberta going it alone. This is not Alberta versus the rest. There is a, an axis, if you will, connecting these different provinces. And they will be consulting very closely and, I think, coordinating their, their, their messages and their campaigns very closely. So as I say, I suspect we're going to have to wait and see exactly uh, how this plays out in terms of I, I don't think Jason Kenney is going to, going to immediately launch some of these provocative measures he was talking about. Uh, during the campaign. He may not do them ever. They may simply no. have been for, for show. What, what do you think, Sachi? Yeah, does this, how does this bode for the rest of the country? Well, it's going to be interesting because I think at first blush, we're looking at Jason Kenney, Scott Moe, Brian Pallister, Doug Ford, this brick wall of opposition uh, against uh, Justin Trudeau. They all talk. They're all on the phone. As Andrew mentioned, they're, they're coordinating their messages. But uh, this also gives Justin Trudeau and the Liberals a lot of, call it ammo or, or material to work with in terms of furthering the cleavage that the Liberals are now trying to force between themselves and the Conservatives as they try to coalesce the left of center again the way they did in 2015 by talking about well what kind of Canada do you want what kind of Canada do you want to stand for and that's a very resonant message obviously not with the people who elected these conservative governments at the provincial level but with progressives with young women with urban voters and so uh, he's he'll have a lot to work with the other side to this too is what if it works? What if uh, Andrew Scheer actually gets elected? What if the Conservatives win the next election? Uh, Kenny, Ford, the rest of them, they all lose their elitist boogeyman in Ottawa. And then the real pressure is on them to deliver the things that they promised to their electorates mm -hmm. without being able to blame it on the PM. Well, I mean, that's that's always the, the, the downside or the, the flip side to these kinds of things. That, you know, Justin Trudeau finds himself, as, as you say, Shachi, against all these people. But on the other hand, Justin Trudeau finds himself against all these people. And that can be that can be very helpful for him as well, can't it, Chantel? Well, uh, and, you know, uh, thinking about your map and the change in colors over the yeah. time that Justin yeah. Trudeau has been prime minister, uh, that is a phenomenon that is cyclical, that we have seen happen every time there has been a change in Ottawa, uh, if the map was so red 
it was because it was the end of the Harper era. He had to contend with Philippe Couillard in Quebec, a liberal, and Kathleen Wynne in Ontario, another liberal. Remember Jean Chrétien uh, had to deal with Mike Harris and Lucien Bouchard. That is, one, not unusual, and two, usually not a... Uh, uh, it's a policy problem for the prime minister of yeah. the day. It's not necessarily an electoral problem. Well, well you do that, have to yeah, giggle a little bit and think about, you know, this is welcome Justin Trudeau to Stephen Harper's nightmare. There's a reason he never wanted to talk to these people towards the end. Yeah. <laughs> That's, yeah, well, that is but true. he didn't he didn't towards the beginning either. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Okay, I, Andrew, go ahead. Well, I wish it were otherwise, but I think it's worth noting that all of these parties campaign against the carbon tax. Yes. So if we're being guided by evidence so far, and who knows exactly how much they played a role in their elections. But if we're guided by the evidence so far, that would say that, that this issue is not playing well to the Prime Minister's advantage. It is playing to the Conservatives' advantage. And if that's a precursor at all for the federal election, then that will be interesting to see. Well, and but I know, that, and I know, but yeah. that, is, uh, that is not true uh, in Quebec. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly not true in BC. No. Uh, and a majority of Ontarians did not vote for the Conservatives. But I think but the interesting thing about this issue is if you go back to the energy wars of the 1980s, it really was Alberta versus the rest. You did not have this alignment now, and I think this alignment has been building for some time between Ontario and the West. Ontario is increasingly looks West for its interests, it takes some of its, its political cues from the West. It doesn't look East the same way, it doesn't look towards Quebec the same way it might have in, in previous elections. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and that's because that's where the population is ascended and where the economy is ascended. Yeah, exactly. It is increasingly yeah, yeah. Okay. A, a Western... F and if you look at that election, we can look at 2015 or we can go back and look at 2011. What Stephen Harper showed was you can win an election now in this country with just the West and Ontario, effectively. Do, and do that, you, will be, that will be a calculation everybody will be thinking about. Just, just quickly, do you all take that as a message, though, that Canadians aren't into the carbon tax? Is that, is that how you read that, or, or, or is that going too far? Shachi, do you want to start on that? I would say uh, that, you know, we noticed a real significant moving of the needle when in the carbon pricing formula, Justin Trudeau came out and said, by the way, we're going to rebate families directly to the household level. You get your money back. That's not what they're talking about. They've been off message for months mm -hmm. now. They mm -hmm. come back to talking about that. I think they're able to move the needle a little bit again. And remember, they need to win in the cities. Like Chantal said, they need to win in Quebec, Ontario and B.C., and they can make the case in places there. Uh, okay, I, I want to do one, one go round on the fact that in, in 20, from 2013 up until Tuesday, there had been a total of six premiers that were women in this country. And, and when uh, the prime minister was elected, I believe there were three uh, in place. I might get the numbers wrong there. But it, should, should we take anything from that? Uh, the fact that uh, Rachel Notley didn't get a second term, uh, that there are no women in these leadership positions in the country. I don't want to make too much out of it. I just I wonder, as a woman myself, what that's about or, or whether that's something we should be concerned about it. Chantal? I don't see it as a gender issue over the same period. I see it more as, as a, uh, a trend towards uh, governments becoming disposable more quickly. Yes, Pauline Marois in Quebec didn't get a second term, but then nor did Philippe Couillard. Uh, yes. New Brunswick has just had four single-term governments in a row. Uh, so yes, they all came to the fore at a time when uh, voters uh, throw out governments more easily, even when the economy is good and they have a good you know, fiscal record to show for their time in government. Uh, Andrew, do you, th do you think there's anything, and it doesn't have to be because it's a gender thing, but is it the fact that they are not there uh, a, a gender thing, or is that of concern? You know, if you if you take the view that maybe women do politics in a different way, does that, and you, you may not, but does that worry you at all? Well, I was going to make exactly the same point that Chantal made, but I'll I'll add to it. Yeah, I mean, obviously, obviously, historically and to this day, uh, there are fewer women elected percentage-wise and fewer that reach to the very top. And obviously, as a society, both for reasons of equality of opportunity and because women may bring uh, different viewpoints and different experiences to it, that's something we want to work on as a society. I, I do want to note that if people are saying they were defeated because they were women, they also won, you know, presumably that that didn't help them, that Kathleen Wynne and Pauline Marois and and Christy Clark and, and Rachel Notley all won elections as women. So uh, there's, I don't doubt there are some voters to this day who will vote against uh, a candidate because they're a woman, but uh, they don't seem to be a, a critical uh, mass. Shacha, what do you see when you look at that? Well, yeah, people not voting for politicians because they're women are increasingly fewer and further between. Obviously, 
times have changed. What's concerning to me overall is just the lack of female participation in politics. When you look at the numbers of, of women around council tables at city and town halls or in provincial le legislatures or in the commons. And so, you know, I think we tend to look at uh, the rise and fall of female politicians more carefully because there are simply fewer of them. When male politicians are turfed out of office, we don't say all oh, laws, you know, they were, they were turfed out because they were men. It's just there's been more of them historically. Yeah. I look forward to the day when you've got, you know, all women leaders running against each other and then we don't have to have that conversation. Yes. That'll be great. And, yeah, that and we should great. say it's probably on balance a good thing that governments uh, can't necessarily count on two terms, three terms in power, that they're a little bit more, uh, have to pay a little bit more attention to the voters. Uh, that's probably on balance a good thing. Uh, I'm going to ask Chantal the last question, and that's, this is just the, the Jason Kenney reach out to the Quebec Premier, Francois Legault, that he did <laughs> in French, that was, not well, uh, that was not well received, I don't think, but what, what, how do you interpret that, given that there is no pipeline project for Quebec? That has faded away completely, so how, how should we read that? Well, uh, the, Jason Kenney and Andrew Scheer keep talking about resuscitating a pipeline that would go yeah. through Quebec. That, I don't think, can happen unless they find some political support for it here because uh, TransCanada and others are not interested in, in yes. getting into that battle. Now, Jason Kenney, speaking French, uh, was maybe not well received, but the message it does send is this is a premier of Alberta who can actually come to Quebec via uh, television if need be, mm -hmm. but speak to Quebecers in French and as someone noted in a column today, without needing someone to translate this French into French. <laughs> so that makes it a bit more efficient if you're going to plead a case directly to people that uh, you are able to do that than Jason Kenney certainly is. Okay, and we'll see where, where it goes from here. Before we go, though, be sure to subscribe to, thank you, everybody. I forgot to say thank you, uh, at Issue the Podcast for extra content. This week, we're continuing this conversation about what's next for Alberta and the changing political landscape. Look for it on iTunes, any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national.